All right, hi everybody. Welcome, I'm really impressed that there's this many folks here on a beautiful day. So thanks for being here. This is the Alaska Center for Energy and Power's community lecture, lecture series. And we're delighted to have it here at the Blue Loon. We've been trying it out here for a few months now and uh, people seem to like it, but we'd always welcome your feedback. We wanna hear, we've had it at the library before, there's other venues, so we're trying to find a place that works for everybody. But this is kinda nice, you can get a beverage, some food and relax, so. We really appreciate you being here. The other thing we'd like feedback on from the community is what you'd like to be hearing about. So we pick topics that we think would be interesting to you, but we'd like to hear what you think are interesting, what you want to know more about. And just to give you a little background on who we are, we are a research group at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. We're based in the, the Institute of Northern Engineering. But really, energy is not a single disciplinary problem. We so we bring partners in from the Geophysical Institute, from the Institute of Social and Economic Research down in Anchorage, from the School of Natural Resources and Agri Agricultural Sciences, because really this is, we need a holistic approach to energy solutions in Alaska. And it's our goal to do applied research, which means we're looking at questions to find answers for solutions today, really in the near term. And we really try to make sure that the people who are making the decisions in Alaska about energy have the information they need to make good decisions and have good information. And that includes each one of you. We all make energy decisions each and every day. So we want to make sure that we provide you with the information that we have to help you make good decisions as well. Just as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones. It's that standard beginning of a lecture reminder, but I know I always have to heat it. So please turn off your cell phones. I'd also like to really thank the Cooperative Extension Service, who's one of our partners in this lecture. They are taping these lectures, and so we're web streaming them right now. And then they're also available, an edited nice version is available after the lecture as well. If you want to share it with somebody or say you wanted to be at a lecture and couldn't be, you can always go to those as well. So thanks to the Cooperative Extension Service. We're going to have two speakers tonight. The first will be Kat Keith. She works for the Alaska Center for Energy and Power as our wind diesel coordinator. She's going to give you guys an overview of wind in Alaska and um, go over some of the success stories, some of the issues that we're having, some of the research needs we have to really do a good job with wind in the future. And then we're going to bring up Kate Lamal, who's the Vice President for Power Supply for Golden Valley Electric. She's going to talk a little bit about the planned Eva Creek wind farm just north of Healy, as well as some of the integration issues with a large-scale grid system. So it should be a good group. We're going to ask you to just save your questions for the end. We'll have the two speakers speak, and then we'll have about half an hour to 20 minutes, depending on how long-winded they are, to answer questions from the audience. So save those. Um, I also just want to point out we've got a table in the back with uh, some literature of projects that we're involved in, research findings. There's also some pens and pads of paper if you want to take notes, so grab those. And um, yeah, please give us your feedback. And so I look forward to, bring, to hearing the lecture tonight, and I'll bring up Kat Keith. Kat, welcome. <laughs> I just like the chairs here. I mean, I think everyone's just going to fall asleep in another half an hour. <laughs> After I throw up a couple math equations, we'll see who starts nodding off. <laughs> Okay, well, Julie did a really excellent introduction to the Alaska Center for Energy and Power, so I'm just going to skip through this uh, part, but um, one of the Alaska Center for Energy and Power has a lot of different um, energy focuses, and one of the focuses is wind diesel, which is an area that I work in mostly. So with the... Um, there. The Wind Diesel Application Center was developed from um, uh, numerous partners such as um, ASAP, the Alaska Energy Authority, the National Renewable Energy Lab, and uh, REAP, the Renewable Energy Alaska Project. These folks got together and realized that there was a real lack of um, effort going on and lack of, I shouldn't say effort, but lack of research and education um, in this field. So WIDAC, as we call it, was developed. And its main focus, as you can read here, is to support um, the broader deployment of cost-effective wind diesel technologies. But ultimately, we want to stabilize and reduce, if we can, the cost of energy in, in these rural communities. So WINAC is focused in three main areas, research and development, uh, technical support, and workforce development and education. 
One of my favorite programs that we get to work on is the Win for Schools program. This is a national Department of Energy program, and the whole intent is to bring energy education into the K through 12 schools. So it's really, really a fun program. We like we um, it starts off by. Uh, playing with wind turbines in the classrooms and seeing if the school wants to install a wind turbine at the school. And we get to uh, teach kids a lot of things through the context of installing a wind turbine. So this is a pretty neat program. So if you, any of you are educators and teachers and want to learn more, please uh, contact me. Another program that's pretty exciting that we've been developing is a wind diesel test bed. This will be installed uh, in Fairbanks closer to the end of the year, and this will allow us to really play around and optimize some of the strategies that we're using to integrate wind turbines onto our diesel power plants, and we'll talk more about that later. But for now, I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about just wind in general. Some of you might not be very familiar with wind energy in general, so I thought I'd talk about that for a few minutes. And I like cartoons. I think it's a good way for adults and children to learn. So this cartoon is showing us that wind, well, these wind turbines are just operating on the basic principle of lift, these standard wind turbines are. And so when, the, when there's wind present, it's just spinning the wind turbine blades around, just as if it was on a pinwheel, and that causes the hub, uh, to s the hub and the, the rotor right there spins as well. This has caused the drive shaft to spin, and, and you can see that, that just creates that spinning, rotating mechanical energy, uh, creates electrical energy in the generator and that's what gets sent out to the grid. And there's few main components of a wind turbine. The, the rotor is that actual hub in the blades. The nacelle is the housing on top, the tower in the foundation. Now there's a lot of different ways to categorize the actual turbine sizes. In Alaska, we're probably different than some of the places in the lower 48. And we think big turbines, we're looking at 100 kW. And down there, they think big, and they're thinking 5 megawatts. So we're a little bit different. But for our purposes, when we talk about small wind turbines, we're talking less than 10 kW. Those are residential uh, wind turbines. You might be familiar with the, the Skystream turbine. That's a, that's a pretty common one. In the intermediate size, we have 10 to uh, 250 kW wind turbines. And these we see, uh, Mike Craft has some out in Delta, the 100 kW Northern Power Turbine. And for us, large turbine is pretty much above 250 kW. And we do have some of these larger turbines now down in uh, Kodiak. Has anyone seen the wind turbines in Kodiak, the 1.5 megawatt GEs? Yeah, they're beautiful, aren't they? Yeah, they're nice. Okay, so here's the equation I was talking about. It's real big. <laughs> and the point of bringing this up is that there's really two key factors when you're talking about getting power from the wind that you want to pay attention to. The first is going to be the velocity of the wind. That's why doing a wind resource assessment is so super critical uh, to knowing how much production you're going to get at the end of the day. So, and you see that it's V cubed. So it's multiplied by itself three times. So the power that you have, the wind speed, <coughs> a small increase in wind speed equals a large increase in power. Uh, the other key factor is the area of the blades. That's the other, that's the A in the equation. That's another thing that we can control. So the larger the rotor diameter, the larger the blades, the more you're able to, the more energy you're able to sweep out of the, um, the wind, basically. So those are two things that we can control. So when you're looking at a power curve, this is the Northwind 100 power curve. You can just see that as the on the bottom you have the wind speed, and on the left you have the power rating. <coughs> so you can see as the uh, wind speed just really increases just a little bit, the power just increases exponentially. Oops. And here's another little graphic just to show you how much your power output increases with the larger blade diameter. So you'll start talking with wind turbine manufacturers, and that blade diameter is a really big factor. So if you can just get an extra meter onto the blade, you're, you're doing really good. So it's, it's a key factor to consider. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about this is just uh, a little bit about turbine design. So right now we're seeing so much um, action happening with uh, individuals and companies coming up with new wind turbine designs. I'm sure you've seen them on YouTube, and there's a lot of different things going on out there. So it's just um, as a consumer, we want to be a little bit cautious because there is a theoretical limit that we're able to get out of the uh, out of a circle of air. You know, and that's called a Betts limit. It's 60 percent that red line, and so the typical blade design that we see. That that's the blue line. That's about, I mean, we're kind of maxing out. We're getting close to our theoretical limit at sometimes. But then we have different, 
different blade designs you can see that have been proposed over time. And the big thing is, is that while these things have advantages, they're definitely not nearly as efficient as the standard three-bladed design. So there's a reason why those are what we're seeing at all of the, the, the big wind farm. Um, another big factor for a successful uh, wind site is just height. You know, the higher you go, the faster the wind speed is going to get. And that's what this graph is showing you. Uh, the, the taller you go, you're going to increase your, the, the, the wind speed and hence your power. So higher is usually better. If you have a choice between a 45 meter tower and a 60 meter tower, usually the 60 meter tower is a little bit more expensive, but it'll pay for itself in the long run. So all of these factors just mean that doing a wind resource assessment is really crucial. And if you're uh, looking for a wind turbine to be installed on your home, the amount of data that you're going to be able to collect is going to be a little bit disproportional to, say, uh, a large wind site. But, but it's important. Uh, you can get information on wind rows, uh, the, the wind direction. You can get uh, information on seasonal changes in the wind and then how it's uh, varying annually. Okay, so enough about that. So on to Alaska. Obviously, Alaska has a lot of uh, wind energy. It's a very abundant resource for the state, and more and more communities spread across the state are starting to uh, install uh, wind into their communities. More and more are. It's becoming uh, uh, an option for a lot of communities. The first wind turbine uh, farm was installed in Kotzebue in 1997, and at that point, it was a pretty much a demonstration site. It was a wind test site. Let's see if we can put wind turbines in the Arctic and get them to work, you know? And it did. So from there, we've just seen more and more installations to the point where here's where we're at today. There's 19 installations. Um, these are all currently uh, functioning, and I say that because some are in varying degrees of functionality, but for the most part, we have 19 systems in the state. And uh, at this point next year, we'll probably, that'll be increased to about 25 or 30 so it's, it's, it's kind of astronomical. And so these numbers alone told us that, hey, we really have a need for something like this wind diesel research center to see how can we be improving the performance of these systems. And so that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit here is what, what are the trends? What, is it, what does it cost to put these up? What should it cost? And how can we make things cheaper? How can we get them to perform better um, if they're not already performing well? But it's still a new technology, just like a lot of these renewable technologies are today. Uh, this chart here is telling us that it, the, on the left, this is July of 01, and on the right, uh, it takes us to the end of the current installations that are planned, let's see, July 2013. <laughs> It's not quite current, is it? But you get the idea. <laughs> the trend of uh, the trend of installed projects. It's it's just skyrocketing right now. And a lot of that has to do with the renewable energy fund um, that the from the state of Alaska. <coughs> so the biggest difficulty I think that we have is that diesel is a really great power generator. Diesels work well, and it's reliable, and we know how they work, and they're relatively inexpensive as long as uh, oil isn't too outrageous. So it's really uh, well understood. Fuel is trans easily transported. So we like diesel. People, it's hard to get rid of it. So when we start throwing in factors like wind or solar or things to complicate the system, um, it's not always taken well. We have to take some other factors into consideration. But uh, there, as we all know, there are a lot of negatives with diesel, and primarily the cost is variable. We have emissions that need to be considered, and fuel has to be stored. So these communities are trying to get at least reduce their diesel consumption to the greatest extent possible. Um, so when we have these diesel generators, I say that they're really good at doing certain things, and they're really good at maintaining power quality in a community. And so there's two factors that we look at when we're talking about power quality. We need uh, frequency control and voltage control. And these are things that when the diesel's on, that's what it does. Um, we talk about diesel gen sets usually, and that's because we have a diesel engine, which is taking the fuel and turning that into mechanical energy. And then we have the generator, which is taking the mechanical energy of the rotating shaft, and then it's turning it to electricity. So these two components are what uh, control the stability of our grid. And we like stability because we don't like it when lights are flickering, and we don't like it when there's brownouts or blackouts, and that's the utility's number one concern in any community is to keep the, keep the lights on, as I'm sure Kate will talk about <laughs> following me. 
Uh, so when we have a diesel-only power plant, it's just diesel. It's a real simple graph. You see, you've got the, the red squiggly line and the blue squiggly line, and they match. So the diesel is load following. It's just exactly. It's pretty straightforward. So, okay, we want to put wind on the system. What happens? So there's a few more uh, words I'm going to throw out there. Uh, we've got something called capacity factor, and this is basically a level of um, percentage of performance. When we start saying, uh, uh, like, if we had 100% capacity factor, that means the wind turbine's rotating uh, uh, successfully 100% of the time. So 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, it's at its rated capacity. That's 100% capacity factor. But that's not realistic, obviously. So most of the wind farms, if they're performing well, we're getting a 30% capacity factor. That's, that means they're doing good. When other systems, and I'll get into that later, when some systems have a 5 or 10% capacity factor, there's definitely something wrong. And what that just means is that the system's not going to be saving the customers any money, because if it's not producing that much wind, it's, uh, that, that's not really what it's intended to do. So another key factor here is when we talk about a penetration, the level of penetration, and that means the amount of wind when compared to the total energy that's being produced at any one point. So uh, when we talk about instantaneous penetration, it's like right now we've got 50% of our total energy being met from wind. <coughs> and that's important because if you only have a small amount of your uh, uh, energy demand coming from wind, say 10%, you know, that's not that much. So the wind can fluctuate all at once, but the big diesel gen set, which is um, providing the power stability, it can, it can make up for that. But when we start reaching 80 or 90% uh, of, of your energy coming from wind, then that's a serious problem because the wind gusts and all of a sudden it's going to drop and your frequency is going to go way out of whack and your computer is going to blow up. And, and so uh, when engineers are looking at designing a system, they look at how much wind are you really going to be putting on it and that's going to dictate how you're going to design your system. So the big, biggest thing is uh, if you have a lot of wind on your system, that's when you're going to start to save money supposedly. The more wind, the less diesel you're going to use, and you're going to be, at the end of the day, uh, reducing your costs. But the only trick is, is that when you have some of these higher penetration systems, and there, I'll go into six examples, but uh, St. Paul Island and Wales, Alaska, these are a couple high penetration systems, you have to start installing uh, auxiliary components. You're going to probably need a battery bank, maybe you'll need a flywheel, maybe you'll need um, just a real advanced inverter, and these are things that just are expensive expensive. They're not. So that has to be taken into account when you have a pretty high capital cost over the course of its lifetime. It's just going to make your wind energy that much more expensive. So there's a pretty fine balancing act between having a system which is very, very cool and produces a lot of wind and offsets a lot of diesel and a system that just is cheap to install in the first place. Hmm. So Alaska has a couple early installations, which thankfully weren't weren't quite this archaic and cool, but <laughs> uh, the first one, like I mentioned, was Kotzebue, and Kotzebue installed three of uh, these integrity turbines in 1997, and then they installed another, they, they, they kept installing them in uh, periods of three or four more at a time until right now they've got uh, 17 wind turbines. They have 15 of these integrities up, one Northwind 100 and one Vestas, which is a 65 kW turbine. So that's what you can see here. They did all of their installations in the winter when the uh, tundra there was frozen and it made the, um, the mobilization of the crane that much easier. But I can't imagine, uh, you know, above the Arctic and Kotzebue in the winter, that didn't probably make the operators very happy to be out there installing it. But um, so it's been very successful at being able to break the barrier in the state of Alaska um, and, and really learn a lot of lessons about how to make these things work. And they learned a lot of lessons because at that point, uh, these turbines weren't cold weather. There were no cold weather packages. They had to design the cold weather packages as they went. So they, they didn't know what a cold weather package was. So it just took them a lot of a lot of mistakes before they could get to the point where the turbines were at a, could... could um, could maintain functioning even in the coldest winter. And so there was the same thing with the Northern Power, Northern 100, which is what these two guys are standing on right now. 
uh, that also didn't have a cold weather package. They had to make a cold weather package by its installation in Kotzebue. So the big thing is, is that Kotzebue is a test site. Uh, its capacity factor is on that lower end, this 10%. And there's two uh, reasons why this is the case. I think the first being that these turbines have a lot of downtime. They're still not performing very well. They're still breaking down a lot. Uh, they need to have a lot. There's a lot of maintenance that goes into them. And it's this turbine. We're seeing it at numerous sites throughout Alaska. It just... Uh, you just have to be, it's, much, it's a much more hands-on turbine. It doesn't necessarily run by itself. So, and as a result of it not being um, um, available that much of the time, the energy from the wind is relatively expensive, 52 cents a kilowatt hour. Now that's still a deal for communities, some who are paying more than that for their diesel electricity, but, uh, but it's expensive. <coughs> so Wales was another demonstration site. Uh, it began, um, it was installed in 2000, but it was uh, first thought of back in around 96 or 97. And the whole point of this, it was really a test site. We were trying to see if we could get a high penetration system to work in a remote site. And so the National Renewable Energy Lab was the one that designed this system and worked really closely uh, with installing it. So they have two integrities up there right now. And they have a battery bank, um, and they do shut their diesels off. When the system was uh, performing as it was originally intended, they shut their diesels off for extended periods of time. And so that's, um, that's kind of a beautiful thing. That's where, where it would be great if we could get other systems to, to, to do this. Uh, and so here's another, you, you can tell I like my squiggly graphs, I'm sorry. I realize I had kind of a lot of them in here this time. <laughs> but this is exciting. You can see that the pink line is the diesel right here. Oh, no, I do have a laser pointer. Uh, you can see the pink line is the diesel, and there it is. It gets shut off. As you see, the wind goes higher than the, than the actual village load. Uh, you can shut the diesels off. So it, it did work. Uh, it's not working so well right now. Things happen in the community just because a project is really technically successful. It doesn't mean that the, um, the environment exists for the system itself to flourish. There's a lot of issues that go into a system like Wales uh, that the operator and the whole community really needs to be behind this project and supportive of this project in order to make it function. Um, the, we've had problems, and, and we're fixing Wales right now. There's money now to go out and repair the turbines and get things up to speed again, but um, there's a lot of technology that exists now that didn't even then. Remote monitoring and satellite communications that even, you know, nine, ten years ago, it wasn't always as easy to have access to those things. So we learned a lot of lessons from Kotzebue in Wales, and I think lessons that came from those communities have really helped with some of the newer installations that we're seeing as a result of the um, Renewable Energy Fund money and, and other funds, but uh, we're... Um, so this is an example of a low penetration system here, and things start getting more complicated. So again, we've got the load up here in blue, and because we have the wind, which I must be the green here, because we have the squiggly wind, which is gusting, now as a result, the diesel has to gust, in it, or the diesel has to fluctuate just as much in order to meet the load. So, but this is a low penetration system, it's just a small amount of wind, and a good example of one of these systems is out in Nome. They've got uh, 18 integrity wind turbines out there, and their wind site should uh, provide about 10% of the community's, uh, ideally it should provide about 10% of the community's um, uh, energy demand. So this was installed December 08, and they had a lot of problems with these integrity turbines, just like Kotzebue did. They had to, the, at the same time they were installing the turbines, right after they were completed, uh, the manufacturer went bankrupt, and they had to get parts, but they, they couldn't get them from integrity, so they had to outsource everything. So this was a com this was all a privately funded project, and the project's uh, manager an operator is Western Community Energy, and these folks were really determined to make this thing really work. So, and, and because this was a privately funded project, they're also able to take advantage of tax credits, the production tax credit, and, the, and, the, um, and as a result, the, their cost of electricity, was their capital cost went down, and so did their cost of energy over time. So Gnome's wind comes in at about 14 cents per kilowatt hour. So what, uh, what I'm talking about, they had to really focus on making these turbines successful. The top graph, the, the green uh, lines are what the wind turbine's actually producing. And, and this is a difference of about four or five months. And so you can see their capacity was 6% you know, six out of what they should be getting was about 30. So they have 
and there's only a few of these green lines here. And then now in April, there's a lot more green lines. Their capacity factor is about 23. And I talked to the operator of the system a couple days ago, and he said they're up to 26%. So it's just a good example to show you that when a community is really serious about making their system work, regardless of having kind of bum equipment without uh, manufacturer's backup, they can make it work. And they've been doing a really successful job of it. So when we get into medium penetration systems, you start having to have more equipment. Um, you're going to have, at some point, uh, over 50% of your energy is going to be coming from wind. And you're going to have to figure out another way to stabilize your power, uh, other than just the diesel generators alone. You need a little bit of help. So what communities like AVEC do, Alaska Village Electric Co-op, has a lot of wind farms in these days. And what they do is they install these North Wind 100s. And they have a secondary load controller and uh, like an electric boiler, basically. So when you have a lot of wind on the system, too much wind, you just heat it, you just send that electricity to a boiler and you get space heat from it instead. So it's something that's really simple, but that heat, we, as we know, that thermal energy is far more expensive these days than electrical energy. So any way that we can get heat f from the wind uh, when we're not using it otherwise, it's, it's a good thing. So uh, it's, it's a benefit to AVEC, but then it's also a good way to manage manage your power quality. So uh, the AVEC communities of like Tuksuk Bay and Kasigluk, they see an average um, capacity factor of around 26%. So um, these turbines are usually available. These Northern 100s have um, been known to be uh, reliable and fairly consistent wind turbines. Um, and so Tuksuk Bay, when they have three up right now, when they get the fourth up, they'll have 400 kW installed. Oop. more squiggly graphs. So, OK, here's St. Paul Island. Uh, St. Paul Island is a high penetration system. So uh, as I was talking about uh, St. Paul and Wales both being high penetration, what St. Paul Island does, instead of having a battery bank, they have a boiler. And they, uh, again, they're able to also shut off their diesel generators for long periods of time. Now, right now, they have three wind turbines that are out there, these big Vestas uh, 225 kW wind turbines. Only one of them is hooked up right now. Um, they're not able to feed the electricity directly to the city. So the residents of St. Paul aren't able to directly benefit from the wind energy. So they've been in negotiations for quite a long period of time trying to figure out how they can get the electricity from the remaining two turbines and, and get that to the community. So going back and forth from a while, uh, you know, fingers crossed, maybe they'll be able to work something out soon. But in the meantime, we still have a really cool high penetration system, which feeds the airport facilities, a hotel. Um, they've got a great class seven wind resource. So this system uh, performs very well. And I like this, that in March 2008, the diesels ran for only 27% of the time. So for those communities and good wind resources, it's pretty exciting to see what, what might be possible. And so one other system I wanted to highlight was in Kodiak. Kodiak Island, these are the 1.5 megawatt GE turbines. The really beautiful ones, which maybe you'll have <laughs> around here somewhere. <laughs> So uh, they've got 4,500 uh, kW of installed wind. And this is neat because this uh, utility ha uh, wants to be, like, I think they have a goal of 95% uh, renewable. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> I'm just glad it didn't happen on the computer. It's OK, Marcus. <laughs> Um, so because it's in a good wind regime, they have a capacity factor of 33%. And because it's performing very well, uh, their cost of energy is less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. <clears throat> OK, so the question is that people have been asking a lot of is, are these wind installations meeting our expectations? So are, we've got 19 systems out there. How are they doing? We're going to be spending more money installing more wind diesel systems. Are they going to do well? Is it worth the investment? So um, we, combined, uh, we combined with the Institute of Social and Economic Research, ICER, to do a study um, to look at this. So we've been doing a lot of research into seeing exactly how these systems are performing. So I have in, uh, listed here um, um, most of the uh, longer standing wind diesel systems. And we can see that for the most part, some of them are, uh, for the most part, they're meeting our expectations. And there's definitely some instances where they're not. So <clears throat> there's a few factors that we were able to 
uh, pinpoint as being big, big players in this. Uh, the first one was turbine manufacture, and I talked about that with Nome and Kotzebue. Selawick is another place where these integrity turbines are installed. There, um, in each case, the uh, systems are not performing as we expect. And when I say as we expect, you can model how these things are going to perform. You can input the wind regime with the village load, and you can kind of get a good idea of what the production should be. And when it's not that way, then we start to ask questions about why. So I think here, in some of these communities, turbine manufacturer has a big, uh, big role. Uh, the communities that are performing really well, St. Paul and Kodiak Island, they have capacity factors over 33%. They're in class seven wind regimes. They've got great wind resources. So even if a turbine's down for part of the time, overall, it's, it's when, when turbines are going and the wind's blowing, they're, they're doing really well. Uh, experience is another big factor. We're looking at uh, AVEC now, who's been installing wind in, uh, boy, I think they've probably got one and a half uh, megawatts of wind in probably five or six communities. I, I'm pretty off on those, I think. But generally speaking, they're at the point now where they have a cookie cutter approach. So they, they know what works. They did it in this community. They're going to do it in this community. They're going to do it in this community. And they're building up a community of folks that, it's, that, they, that they can, uh, they've got 25 trained operators that can, or wind technicians that can go up and take care of problems. So they're building up a culture where these things can be successful. Uh, so you can see that in Savunga, Kasigluk, uh, Tuxuk Bay, they're all performing well. And in St. Paul Island, that was a new installation for Alaska, but Northern Power Systems, the one that designed it, had a lot of experience designing these uh, remote high penetration systems. So it was, a, it was a good design. And another factor that's interesting is private funding. Uh, when you don't have to wait um, for state or federal grants to come in, you're able to move a lot quicker uh, with the construction project. So we're noticing that when folks are able to move quickly with private funding, um, it was able to prevent some construction delays, for example, and, and um, get installed a little bit quicker. Okay, so lastly, community factors. And I mentioned this in Wales, that the system can uh, technically was very sound, but it just at that point didn't have the support to make this system flourish. So in Wales, once funding ran out for this really cool test project um, from NREL, when there was no more money left for NREL to play in Wales, then who could they pick up the phone and call when the system stopped working. You know, when, when there was an, uh, an error that came up on, on their computer, who, who could they call? And there wasn't anybody. So these are things that when we're installing new systems and we're being more aggressive with our installations, we need to keep in mind the, the maintenance and the long-term O&M plan for these communities. Because if we don't build that into these systems, they're just going to be failed systems. And I don't think anybody wants to see that happen. So, but the, the news is ultimately good, is that we're seeing the, um, the this is basically like a grading, this, this is my A, A, B, C, D, F <laughs> system, but it, it's not quite that linear, but uh, the trend is, is that installations that we're starting to see happen over the past few years, they're doing very well, they're performing like they should, uh, we're on the right track. Uh, systems that aren't doing so well, there's reasons why they're not doing so well, they're, they were not intended to produce necessarily all the electricity they could. There are test sites or their pilot projects. They have turbine manufacturer problems. But moving forward, I think we're able to identify some things that um, are going to ensure that they're going to continue to perform well. And I think I think I'll end up here. I just wanted to show you a little bit if anyone's interested in um, you know, how much these things cost. This, I'm not the economist, so you can see I didn't have very many uh, numbers and price tags on any of this. But we're able to figure out, um, it's hard to, to capture all the cost data, because up till now, there hasn't really been any strict reporting. I mean, there hasn't been a way to collect the data for how much these things cost. And every company categorizes their costs in different ways, so we're not sure how much is construction or what is equipment versus construction and what's what. So, but we have a general idea that these things are costing us somewhere between $4,700 per uh, kW all the way up to almost $11,000 per kW. So this is very different from places in the lower 48 where they're saying wind costs, you know, $2,000 a kW. So our situation is definitely different. And it's, it's kind of intuitive, but wind sites that are in a small rural area are going to be more expensive than urban Alaska. So these are 
intuitive, but it's just good to have some price tags because now we can look at this and say, hey, we, we can do something about this cost. We, this construction cost is way too high. Let's find a way to minimize the foundation costs and see if we can make these things more affordable. Um, so it was the last squiggly graph. Uh, when I started doing this study, what was really interesting is that it was really pretty and it all matched and it was everything was even. And then as you started getting more data, then there would be like a squig, you know, <laughs> there'd be a little dip or, you know, there'd be a spike. So I think what this is showing us, what I originally thought that I could probably show was that as a, a level of penetration, as you have more, lev more wind on your system, that the cost of energy would go down. Because theoretically, and through our modeling, that's what we see. But there's just too many other factors to be able to see such a nice, easy conclusion. So we're seeing here, like with GNOME, that's what this is. Uh, it, it doesn't have very much wind on the system, but because they had private funding and could utilize the federal uh, tax credits, then hey, they. That's pretty cheap power. Uh, and the same is here with Kodiak. You know, Kodiak, they, they're they really only getting 10% of their energy from wind. So it's not really a high penetration system, but they utilize economies of scale. They've got these three big turbines. And as a result, their, their cost of power is down. And so then, but you can see that we do have some outliers here with Kotzebue, Selowick, those, you know, integrity turbines, their, their power is pretty expensive. So. Uh, next year, when we have even more installations, hopefully we'll be able to fill this out a little bit. Because certainly right now, we don't have that much data. There's not that many systems out there, but at least we can start to trend what's going on right now and, and, and take that forward as we uh, make you know, more planning decisions. So that's what I have for now. And if anybody wants a copy of that report, you're welcome to contact me and I can forward it to you. Because it's just a thrilling, thrilling read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's got to clean up her lemons. <laughs> All right, I'd like to bring up now Kate Lamal. Again, Kate is the Vice President of Power Supply for Golden Valley Electric, and I'm looking forward to hearing about their projects. Thank Thanks, you. Kate, for being here. Uh, pleasure to be here tonight. Thanks for all coming and uh, on this beautiful day that we have out there. And um, I hope that uh, I'll be able to give you some information here that, that uh, will be helpful to you and then we'll be open for questions. Golden Valley Electric has been looking um, <coughs> at wind resources, at renewable energy for quite a number of years now, well over 10. Our mission and goals uh, in the renewable and alternative energy was to be ready for uh, installation of renewables or alternatives when um, certain thresholds were met. And the main one that we've always kept our eye on was that um, we could install renewable energy that would have no cost impact to our members, so that it would be equal to or less than our avoided cost. Um, there are a lot of people that would be, there are some people that would be willing to pay more for renewable energy, but there's also a lot of people that do not want to. And you all know how challenging it's been over the last couple of years with the high electric bills that you've had as um, uh, oil and fuel prices have skyrocketed. So we want to keep uh, cost and control. That's been our focus. Uh, we think we have found a very elegant solution. In addition to that, our board of directors set a renewable energy pledge a number of years ago that 20% of our uh, energy will be uh, supplied by renewables by 2014. And that's another goal that we've kept our eye on. And again, I think that uh, we've um, We've got a pretty good solution right now, and that's in our Eva Creek Wind Project. And Eva Creek is located um, just north of Healy. In the, it's in the foothills, uh, right by the community of Ferry. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, first about the um, Eva Creek area, what the wind site looks like. We've been collecting data there for well over five years. I think some of our sites have been there for seven years. It's a very well-developed resource, very well-analyzed resource. And again, because of a couple of um, alignments, uh, we believe that we can now bring the project in. 
In any typical wind project, you have to start by doing preliminary investigations. What we did was we took a, um, Kat showed a picture of Alaska with the wind resources identified. We took our, our system, which of course stretches from Cantwell across and down um, south of Delta, and we did a computer-generated uh, wind resource analysis, which looked at terrain enhancements. Because the central part of Alaska in, in Kat's um, uh, uh, map, it, it's not overall a very good one, but we have a lot of <clears throat> areas where the hills and the, the terrain has enhanced the wind and made them pretty favorable. So we laid that over um, our system, and then we laid over our transmission lines because uh, getting the wind energy into the system, of course, can be quite an expense, and we wanted to put it as close to one of our transmission lines as possible. So anyway, that was in the one of the preliminary investigations. And Anyway, there's a number of steps that you have to go through in, in evaluating projects. I mean, it, this is really typical of any project. You, you first of all conceive of the project, and then you see whether it's, uh, you know, a, a broad brush, what it's going to look like. Then you start getting down into the details. You start doing economic analysis, operability, et cetera, and, and uh, go through it. So where we are on Eva Creek in this kind of prescriptive uh, project management um, process is this. Um, what I've got here is these are kind of the steps you go through, and over here I've got where we are. So we have seven years of data on Eva Creek, uh, and we have right now a 36% uh, gross capacity factor. Now, once you factor in all of the on-site work, et cetera, it's not going to be quite that high, but it's a decent resource. So it, uh, it's a bank, what we call a bankable resource, and we have bankable data. What that means is that you've got good enough information with a good enough project that a bank would lend you money on it. That's, that's really the big test. Could you get money to build it? Um, so again, we set our target uh, goal of cost at uh, less than or equal to avoided costs so that our ratepayers would see no impact in their bills when we added renewables. Um, we have defined our land acquisition issues, et cetera, which we've been ongoing as we put up our wind uh, data acquisition sites. And um, we have a preliminary finance plan. And one of the things that's changed in the project is this. <clears throat> There are a lot of federal incentives out there for renewables. And in addition to that, there is the state's renewable energy fund. Now, the renewable energy fund has been limited to us uh, only less than $2 million for rail belt utilities. We did get a $2 million grant for Eva Creek. That was after uh, we had already been out there um, using Golden Valley's money for about five years of wind data collection. And what we've used that current $2 million grant for is to further um, our studies. We're doing um, accessibility. Uh, road construction issues. We're doing an avian study, and we're doing a number of other studies um, that that I'm going to talk a lot more about, which is wind integration and how we plan to integrate it into our system. Um, <clears throat> and we've used that two million dollars for that. But what's really changed the um, focus for us is this. Independent power producers have the ability <clears throat> to go to this. Uh, to, to build renewable projects and turn around and take a tax credit. And so what that does is it reduces their cost of energy because they can take a tax credit. Because Golden Valley is a not-for-profit, we don't pay taxes. And so that incentive was not available to us. And so the federal government answered that by offering CREBS, Clean Renewable Energy Bonds. Now, CREBS have been out there for a number of years. <clears throat> the early offerings went quickly and, uh, and, and were basically used up. The CREBS was refinanced or reissued here about a year and a half ago, <clears throat> but because there were so many other tax incentives out there, 
the crabs weren't being sold and the federal government has now turned around and they are giving you a direct giving um, the crabs users a, a direct rebate on those crabs what it gives us in this project is an effective interest rate of 1.9 percent and it brings this project down into an area of cost that is going to be we believe we can bring it on at less than or equal to our avoided cost. That is the biggest factor is the cost of money that we can get to build this project. So that's where we are and that's why it, it's, um, uh, we're moving forward with it right now and hoping to get it into development. So quickly running through some slides. So what's good about Eva Creek is the terrain. It's in the foothills. Uh, we have these rolling hills. The wind comes down out of the mountains. We get the mountain thermals. But in addition, the, the wind rolls down these hills and gains momentum and and runs over the ridge tops and that's what gives us our good um, you know 30 plus capacity factor accessibility on Eva Creek is a challenge there is no there is no highway access to it the only access is across the the bridge at ferry across the railroad bridge at ferry across the Nanana River now we have just had a, 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 a firm up there that's been helping us define how we're going to get the wind turbines up the hill because they're huge these are huge wind turbines and <clears throat> they were just up there uh, last week we can get all everything we need across the railroad bridge on rail cars there's a rail siding on the other side it appears to be big enough so that um and then then there is um there are roads up there this is an old mining area and so once you get across the river there are people that live in ferry and there is also all of these roads that go up and over to the Liberty Bell mining area. A lot of people use this area for hunting. One of the concerns of the ferry people and the Healy people was, please don't cut our access off. And we're going to easily be able to do that because we'll just have each wind turbine um, uh, you know, by itself leaving access across the um, um, ridges to hunters or whoever wants to. It is on the inner tie. This, this facility, we're going to be able to connect right up to the existing northern inner tie. There's actually a tower in there, which I can't see at the moment, but I know it's in there somewhere. Hopefully you can see it. Although, you know what? The inner tie was built so you can't see it. So you're not supposed to be able to see it, but it is in there. And... <clears throat> And then there is mining in the area. As a matter of fact, a company called Metallica has now put together a huge block of claims, and our <clears throat> prospects are really overlying their prospects. But we've been uh, in conversation with them. Uh, we think that we can coexist actually quite well together, making sure that we're just not building on the richest ore body up there. That's our hope anyway. So, uh, uh, But they're up there working this summer on some of the prospects. Here's some of the old tailings down in the, down in the valley there. <laughs> it's beautiful up there, as you well know, as anywhere in Alaska is, but uh, it's quite lovely. There is some icing, you know, in the winter, what you don't want is the blades to co get covered with ice. <clears throat> Usually in Alaska, what they're having to do, and some of the problems that Kat was showing in her, her pictures, some of it is icing. If the blades ice up, just like if you've got an airplane, you know, you get icing on it and you're in trouble, and, and these blades can ice up. And here, this picture is just showing you some of the icing on, uh, this is one of our MET stations out there right now. <clears throat> Okay, what I want to talk about or focus in on here in the last few minutes of my talk is, is what we mean by integration. Kat did a really good introduction of it. Just expand your thoughts now to Golden Valley system. We don't have a single diesel that we regulate the wind with. We have a multitude of generators, uh, generation units that we put online. We always load up. We always load from the cheapest up to the highest cost. So our cheapest units are all, you know base loaded and we, we fill in with our higher cost um, uh, units typically. And <clears throat> we have to make the decision, the, f come up with the answers of things like how will Golden Valley's system um, react to rapidly changing wind because the wind starts and stops a lot. Um, faults on the line near the wind farm or faults caused by the wind farm, how are we going to uh, run through that? Uh, how are we going to deal with that? What kind of protections can we put on? There's a lot of hardware protections you can do, but we've got to test the system to see what those protections are. Um, and uh, then, you know, basically, what will it cost? Now, <clears throat> 
CAT's numbers at the end, understand those were for small units. We are anticipating right now um, that the <clears throat> 24 megawatts of the Eva Creek will cost about uh, $3,900 per kW installed. And I just did put up a comparison of our, our newest power plant that we just built out in North Pole. It's a combined cycle gas turbine. And it was installed for 1,700. It's 60 megawatts. The wind farm is uh, 24. So wind is very expensive. It's got a very high capital cost, and that's just the way it is. So you've got to find ways to bring that cost down so that you you know you don't impact your system. The Eva Creek wind is really good regime. The, what, what the wind rose does is it just shows you where the wind blows in a in a given time period. And this one is um, for this is a four year wind rose, really strongly to the south. Usually what the wind um, turbines do is they'll feather in the wind so that they'll constantly face it. You know, in some respects, we hardly need to do that. We could stick it up facing that wind and leave it there, but we'll, we'll probably feather it. <clears throat> That's just the way the technology is right now. Again, this is a, a, a chart that, that Kat showed you. What happens here is that before you even start generating power, you've got to have somewhere in the three to four <clears throat> meters per second wind, you max out when the wind is somewhere around 14 meters per second. And you can see this growth right here um, and, and, and how steep that curve is. And then it maxes out. What happens in the high winds, they'll be usually be shutoffs of the wind turbines. They can't operate in really, really strong uh, turbulent wind. But <clears throat> you know, once you've hit the maximum uh, wind speed, you just, you, you've, you've maxed out the capacity. <clears throat> this is one of Kat's squigglies showing the variability of wind at Eva Creek. And I want to note just a couple of things. <clears throat> this is time in minutes. Um, and so you can see that this uh, wind can change five megawatts in a matter of, of minutes. We have two two minute wind data that at some point times looks like a solid block because the wind is going up and down so fast. Some of the 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 aspects of the the severity of these ups and downs will be mitigated a bit by having a farm. We're anticipating 16 turbines, and so theoretically, as the wind dies down, it will it, it will go across that wind farm, and you'll you'll get more of an a, a rounding or undulation of these, and you can react quicker. But it's still pretty deep reaction into your system to to follow the wind, and so. <clears throat> I want to focus on this this one for a minute, so so bear with me while I explain what this is. What I'm showing here is um, <clears throat> what a typical year looks like in our system as we load up units. And what we do is we load up units from cheapest to, uh, all right, so what we've done here is we have projected what our energy requirements are going to be on a month-by-month -month basis for a year. This is what we do to, to, for our budgeting and our planning and whatnot. Okay, so I, again, remember, this is spread out over a month. So what we're looking at are not those minute-by-minute -minute peaks that I was showing you in the last slide, but rather um, so everything smoothed out. <clears throat> what this band is up here is the wind. And in, with our anticipated capacity factor um, of about 30-plus percent, on average, we're anticipating that, that there'll be about 9 megawatts available out of that 24 megawatt wind farm, okay? So we build 24 megawatts with the expectation that we get 9 out of it. So, you know, if you start thinking about that, we're going to be installing 24 megawatts at uh, almost $4,000 a kW. Well, the reality is we can't use 24. We're only going to get 9 out of it. So, you know, it, it's a little bit daunting when you think of it that way. But that being said, the savings in wind is avoided fuel. That's how you get savings out of wind. It's not the cost of them because they're very expensive. You get the savings by avoiding burning fuel. But what happens in an integration is this. So these are all different generating units that we've got through the year. And so this purple one on top is one unit that 
<clears throat> we're anticipating using during the winter, if you forget the wind for a minute, it goes off in the April, May time frame, comes back on a little bit in the summer, and then comes back on. Well, what happens with the wind is the wind's going to eat up some of that generator. Now, that's good because we're going to be avoiding that, that fuel there. But what happens is, is that little area right there, what happens there is you end up turning that unit on just to follow the wind. And that's when it starts getting very expensive. And those are the kinds of things that we have to mitigate. Because once you start a unit, these, these turbines that run on gas and they're running at the low end of them, that's their most expensive point. So what we are trying to do at Golden Valley is figure out ways to avoid starting a unit to follow the wind. As Kat was talking about in these small um, facilities, small utilities, Theoretically, they have one diesel and, and then their wind. And so the diesel goes up and down behind the wind to make sure that it's invisible to everybody. You don't want your lights going on and off and you don't want your power quality to go down, the brownouts or the flickering or whatnot. <clears throat> so that's the challenge is the wind integration and that's the cost of it. Now there's a, a, a number of different technical things to do. We are investigating a way to use the battery. Right now the battery the way it is doesn't work to follow wind. It's not the type of battery you can follow wind with. It's one that has to go through a deep cycle discharge before you can recharge it and use it. But we're investigating perhaps other types of batteries. You could do you could do wind. wind. I mean, are there programs out there I can get money so I can do this to my Yeah, for information on that, I'd recommend just looking at some of the local dealers. Um, you know, that deal in renewable energy systems for residential units. Yeah, yeah, there are. There's there's solar tax credits. Um, so so yes, there are, and that those. I, I don't think either one of us are pretty good on, on res residential tax incentives, but, but there are people that are. And so looking at like ABS Alaskan or um, uh, Greg Egan's company, um, uh, what is somebody? Remote power systems, thank you. Yeah, they're really good at knowing exactly what your, what, what's your situation and, and what tax credits are available. Yeah, and they might not be available for a long time, but they're available now, so <laughs> yeah. Yes, and that's the difference between the gross capacity factor and the net capacity factor. Yeah, and that's probably around 32, 33, for Eva Creek anyway. Mm -hmm. Those are folks that are living in, in communities that are trained. Um, usually what happens is they're trained, they're, they're full-time operators, and then now they're being trained on wind as well. And so um, they, I do, they do have a group of, um, you know, probably more advanced. There's different levels of wind training that you can get. Uh, you, can you can have a windsmith, you can have a wind technician, or, you know, it just depends on your level of skill. So there are a few folks, I'm sure, that are Anchorage-based that have more um, advanced skills possibly that do fly in and out as needed. But uh, for the most part, folks are living in, in the communities. Um, another example is out in Nome, the Western Community Energy guys. They've hired um, about five or six local guys and at this point, I think they have two that are full-time and, and a couple that are part-time, and they've uh, brought the training to them and have, have done the work. So it is neat to see that some of the, these developers are really focused on building up that local capacity to maintain the systems.
patch of systems because it could be easier maintenance. But I guess the big thing is, um, you know, a lot of what I was uh, looking at here has to do with utility scale commercial systems. And that at this point, there are no um, utility scale commercial vertical axis wind turbines. Um, and so even on the residential side, there's definitely some, um, you know, brilliant ideas out there. But trying to find one um, that's been able to withstand rigorous testing, like at the National Renewable Energy Lab's test site. You know, they've had some there that they've been trying to test and they, they blow apart when winds get too intense. So I think it's definitely, um, the, the big advantage of these types of wind turbines is that, as Kate was mentioning, there's a cut-in speed, usually at, you know, three and a half uh, meters per second, or, you know, you have to have wind of about seven miles an hour before you can get wind. And the nice advantage, um, like you're mentioning, with these vertical axis wind turbines, uh, the ones that, you know, spin uh, ar around the axis like this, they have, um, they, they can cut in usually at about two or three miles an hour. I just saw, I was looking at one from Honeywell that designed a pretty neat one that looks really intriguing. It kicks in at seven and it, seven miles an hour and it shuts off at about 45 miles an hour. So there's advantages. Um, I just think right now the market for those uh, turbines is still pretty young. And so I look forward to the time when they have more testing on them. Um, and where they can increase their efficiency a little bit because it's still, the, the vertical axis wind turbines, their efficiency is usually about 10, 10%. Whereas vertical axis or the, you know, the standard wind turbines there at the best, I mean, 30%. So it's just, it's, it's not always that great, but uh, there's definitely a place for them. But I, I, I think um, more testing needs to be done to make sure that manufacturers are really maintaining the integrity of their systems and not just trying to make money because it's a good idea, you know, so. I hope that didn't sound too harsh. I was <laughs> trying to be <laughs> neutral. Yeah, Mike? Well, I was wondering, when you start running the wind farm and uh, when the Healy Clean Coal Power Plant eventually comes online, what do we have for line capacity on the Northern Intertie and, and do those two systems work well together? There is capacity on the Northern Intertide to, to accommodate both of them, yes. And <clears throat> we really don't anticipate doing wind following with coal. So I'm wondering if both plants are running at the same time, not using it to follow, but say you're following with diesel and caramaze, and you're using the wind farm and the Healy Clean Coal Power Plant, and you're sending that power from the Healy to Fairbanks. Is that a friendly system, I guess? Is that it, it, it is. Um, it is workable. It's certainly one of the, the scenarios uh, that we have studied extensively in our, um, some of our transient stability studies that we've done to see, and they do, they do accommodate, we can accommodate it with the existing system, yeah. We, we may have to put another static VAR compensator out there, but for, for transient stability, but, but we can pretty much accommodate it and, and take care of it. Anticipate your operation and maintenance costs per kilowatt hour on Eva Creek. Hmm. <laughs> I should have that number right. Uh, yeah. Report I read recently, um, and who, which was quoted by the uh, Institute of Electrical and Electronics uh -huh. Engineers. They were quoted as 27 cents per kilowatt hour, but the quote was wrong. It was really 2.7. So uh, 2.7 is sort of a number that I've read. I just wondered what yours was. You know, I, I, I wish I had the exact number. So I'm, I'm um, but it, it, it is in that range. It's probably in the three to four cents per kilowatt hour for us. One of the reasons it's probably a little bit higher than standard is be, because of the rem remoteness. But we've got an advantage because we, I've got staff down there in Healy that we're gonna leverage. So we, you know, we're gonna train some of our existing um, personnel to, uh, and you know, the reality is most of them are, um, it, it's mechanical and electrical that you need down there. So it's not as if you need an operator, you need, you need uh, people to repair it and, and keep it running and whatnot. So. Yeah, and we've got plenty of very qualified E&Is and, and mechanics, not in wind, but we'll get them there. And, you know, take advantage of some of the programs that the state's developing for training, for certainly. Yeah, yeah, the wind is not cheap. 
See, the balance of our of it w is going to be debt. So it's debt and O and M. That's what the cost is. Plus, then if you start putting the cost of regulating on it, it it's yeah. That's why we've always had the goal of at or below avoided cost. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and and just to add to that, you know, when the state was reviewing the renewable energy fund projects, they were using four cents per kilowatt hour. And I think in some communities, like in rural areas, it's actually a little bit higher than that. So we sh should not be shy on the O&M. And part of the problem is just the short time period that we've had to track what O&M is going to be. And we've also lacked the mechanism to really track what the O&M costs really are. I mean, a lot of times diesel and wind turbine costs are just bunched together. So how do you separate what's diesel and what's wind when people are doing the same thing? So it's it's a bit of a puzzle to track it down. So I think four cents is would be great for the rail belt. And if four cents would be great for rural Alaska too, but it's probably even a little bit higher. Yeah. Uh, oh, the guy in the white shirt. Uh, about the uh, level of interest and involvement in the various turbine manufacturers for these northern and arctic installations, maybe from an RV. I'm going to make, make an it. editorial comment. <laughs> they are very interested. A couple of things that have made them very interested, and then I'm going to let Kat talk because she's dealt with a lot more. <clears throat> the downturn of the, of the economy outside has made, um, coupled with the fact that our state has committed $250 million to a renewable energy fund, has made us very attractive. That's that's the truth. It, it, uh, that $250 million renewable energy fr fund brought uh, manufacturers to Alaska and willing to work in the cold weather environment. So, and I'll let you speak to that. Okay. So that being said, <laughs> I, I, I think that's all very accurate. But one of the biggest challenges that we're finding, too, is the turbines that we need aren't necessarily available. Like, we've got. Wow. You know, as you're seeing on some of the graphs that I showed, what we're starting to need now are bigger turbines, um, not the 65 kW turbines. Let's start installing some 600 kW turbines, and then that's when we're going to start to see the cost of energy uh, start to go down a little bit. And those are the turbines that aren't available. When we start looking at some companies like uh, Furlander or uh, Entercon that won't deal with us or um, anyway, so this, this whole mid-scale turbine market is, is not the best. And the trick is, is that Alaska, this mid-sized turbine market that, that we're really uh, needing in Alaska for some of the remote communities, that, that's not very exciting. I mean, if they look at the market up here, it's maybe two or three turbines, maybe five. So, and it were a big hassle for them because they'd have to consider a whole O&M package just for Alaska. So it's hard to get them to, to be serious about talking to us, I've, yeah. I've noticed. But... But I think what Kate is saying is right, is that manufacturers that have been working with Alaska already, they're, they're just taking us a little bit more seriously. It helps to have money behind the desire. Yeah. You know? and, and then just to add on to that is that <clears throat> turbines are getting bigger. You know, the workhorse of the fleet outside are the GEs. They were 1.5. They're now 1.6. You know, they have changed the technology to get more out of it. You know, they're making two megawatts. They're making five megawatt, four megawatt. That that market that Kat's talking about, it, it, it's not a market really um, applicable many other places in the world. Because you got your residential use, and then you've got the big um, industrial use. So she's right. It is a, it's a very special market that's, that is difficult to, to find, to get people interested in. But when you find those manufacturers that do think that Alaska is a neat place to work within, then I think we can have some really cool synergies happen because they definitely are manufacturers that do like remote power. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, how tall are the one and a half uh, megawatt units, and how long are the blades that you're contemplating at Eve Creek, and uh, what kind of specialized equipment is necessary to? set them and, and uh, perhaps uh, maintain. Is that 
the specialized equipment available in the state? Uh, no. no. The cranes that are needed to set them up are not available in the state. Um, that was for Kodiak when they did their installation. Their cost of installation um, was equal to the cost of buying the turbines because in Kodiak they had, you know, barge them up, offload them, take them up a very steep mountain hill. So, uh, but the, the turbines needed to set the 1.5s or bigger are not available in the state so they will have to come in and in addition they will need to come in for maintenance um, fire island is the the wind farm proposed for uh anchorage same thing what i suspect may happen is that if fire island and eva creek go and are built someone may get a, a crane otherwise we'll just bring one up every two to three years to do work on them So it's 80 meter. What are they? Meter yeah, the towers. 80 meter is the the data. The yeah, I don't. Do you know, Mike? Okay, thanks. Yeah, they're big. I, I have one more question about the, the current. What do you okay, what do you guys think you're going to be able to produce electricity for off the Eagle project, and how does that relate to? the avoided cost of, say, today, for example? Our anticipation right now is, uh, let's see, our avoided cost right now is 10.6 cents. Um, it, it should be below that. That's what our anticipation. Of course, we'll have a much better handle on that once the bids come in to build it. But that's what we're anticipating, is less than that, probably somewhere around 9 cents. Well, that represents an opportunity, basically, to stabilize the rates on the production capabilities of the wind farm, that price will not change from now through 20 years. I mean, is that a fixed, once you have that thing up, yes. on, that's a fixed price. It doesn't matter what happens to oil, that price is going to stay the same. Well, well, see, Golden Valley, down. what we do is, is, as we pay the debt off, the, the actual price of it will go down. So, yeah, It'll, it should diminish in the future. Some of the bids that were coming in were on the order of 14 cents a kilowatt hour ish, and that didn't include the cost of regulation. So they, they, they were they were not uh, they, they were not willing to uh, assume the, the risk of regulation. So that would have meant that we had to load follow and we had to spend the, the uh, fuel to follow their their load. So it. So 14 cents plus regulation compared to what now? To, to what? Yeah, to what now? Uh, we're, we're, we're anticipating Eva Creek to come in at or below our current avoided cost, which is 10.6 cents. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cook Inlet is, uh, owns Fire Island, the island itself. They have the project and they're trying to find people to purchase the power right now. Their challenge is that the folks in Anchorage have really cheap electricity right now. So, you know, they're wrestling with this. Are they going to be willing to pay more for wind? That's, that's their challenge. On the white shirt. wind turbines and uh, birds and other parts of the world. Can you comment uh, on the any issues or concerns with turbines in Alaska and wildlife? Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, thankfully, now Fish and Wildlife is very, very strict about any, any installation that goes in these days has to have a lot of avian studies done. And so if there's any concerns prior to installation, and those are, those are dealt with accordingly. And so it's, you know, as, as, as I'm aware of, there's certainly been no big problems in Alaska. And what's interesting, as I learned from Tom at some point, who could comment on this much better than I could, that it's, it's a lot of times in the lower 48, bats are more of a problem than birds are. But 
Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that has to be thought of. If you're going to be, especially with uh, all of our coastal waterways and uh, migratory routes, I mean, we, you definitely have to take that into consideration. But, but I guarantee you that any developer is going to look at that prior even to uh, doing a wind study <laughs> because if, you, if you're going to have a hurdle with permitting, it's, it's no, no use looking at. But yeah. what about Eva yeah, Creek? <clears throat> at Eva Creek, we have, um, uh, are in the middle of the avian study that we're doing. Uh, it, we've had, we had a crew out there during migration uh, with radar and they'll be there for the fall migration. What we found at Eva Creek is that <clears throat> uh, the birds generally during, th they're really only a, a major issue during migration and the cranes and swans come through. Typically in this area, they come over very high. And the only time that, that it appears that we've seen in the past that they come down is when it's foggy. But when it's foggy, the wind's not blowing. So we, we think we can mitigate. So, so far, no glaring problems. And there are different strategies that folks have developed, having bird diverters, and there's different things that you can do if there is a, a bird mitigation problem that sometimes fish and wildlife will, will enforce uh, if they believe there's going to be a concern. And then they do follow up, you know, every, every two or three years. I think for the first two or three years of a project year, people are walking the, the grounds and, and doing bird counts as well to make sure that it's not really an issue. I saw a fellow in the back with an orange shirt had a question. I see you back there. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, could you show that slide with the hierarchy of fuels again and tell us what those were? Super, 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 super. Healy Unit 1, Bradley Lake, uh, Anchorage Inner Tie, Non Firm Anchorage, our North Pole Expansion Project, our North Pole Gas Turbine, and our Zenders. Frame 7, this is an LM6000, frame 7, frame 5. Okay. 5 is at the downtown? Yes, yes five, 5 is downtown. Five. What's the gas going to cost when it gets here? Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea because I have no idea what it's going to cost when it gets here. It certainly won't be cheaper than coal. It won't be cheaper than Bradley. Bradley's the hydro down at Homer. And it, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's really reasonably priced. This is Cook Inlet gas here. So who knows what gas is going to come? Is it going to be cheaper than Cook Inlet gas or more expensive? Who knows? You know, and how's it going to get here and et cetera. So that's a good question, but I don't know how to answer it. Yeah. Um, is the Healy coal mine and the wind farm at Barry in competition? Um, and also, how well received is this wind farm uh, for, for the town of Healy and the Alaska Railroad? Well, um, you know, Usabelli uh, is in favor of it. As a matter of fact, we evaluated going through the mine and coming in the backside of Eva Creek to see if it would be cheaper because of the, the problem with the railroad bridge and not having a road across. Um, so Usabelli is totally in support of Eva Creek. It's not at all in competition with them or what they do. Um, <clears throat> We have had several uh, public meetings in Healy, um, and the last one of which was maybe a month ago. The community is, is pretty much in support of it. What they want to make sure of is that their, their quality of life doesn't change, and so that 
you know, as they go, the, this area up here is really, I mean, it looks remote, but it's its really pretty accessible because of those roads that are up there, people four wheel and hunt. And, as long, and, and what we understand is that as long as they have access through this area that we don't fence the whole thing off, they're, they're going to be okay with it. Um, so I can't answer that 100% because you just never know, but the feeling that we've had uh, and, and the discussions that we've had, there's a pretty good community support down there for it. So we'll see. Yes, on those big wind turbines that you said had to be trucked up the hill, could they use a Chinook type helicopter to do that? I think they're too big for that, but um, because that's not not been a typical installation, um, but it, it's certainly something that we can evaluate. Yeah, I, I I agree. Yeah, get it as a training exercise. <laughs> Did you guys have a comment? Did you think it could be done? Each tower section is about 110,000 pounds. Hey, Kat, have you introduced Mike, by the way? Oh, just so we know who's. Who, who I keep <laughs> mics. <laughs> Well, if you guys haven't seen, if you if you want to get your eyes on a couple of wind turbines, you can always head out to Delta, take a nice nice trip, and go visit Mike's site out there. He's got a lot of exciting projects going on. Uh, he's got a Northwind 100 installed, a 900 uh, KW EWT. Is it hooked up? It's online right now. It's online. That's been see another. It's a good example of a mid-sized turbine market that just. Not always. There's not always a lot of options when you're looking at that mid-sized market. So. Yeah. 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 So more to come in Delta. Okay, so the Win for Schools, uh, like I mentioned, this is a Department of Energy program. We're really lucky to be uh, awarded a contract. There's only 11 states in the U.S. that are a part of this program. In Alaska, I got the contract today. So today, <laughs> we've been waiting for a long time to do that. But <laughs> uh, so what we get to do now, um, we have we're expecting to install about five of these ice streams at schools over the summer, and we have locations all over the place. Uh, Mount Edgecombe, Sitka, uh, Palmer, the job there is going to be putting one up. Uh, there's one in Palmer at Sherrod Elementary. Uh, we've got, boy, um, Kaufman Cove, Haynes is looking at one. I mean, they're just all over, spread all over the place. So we've got um, schools can be involved with installation of a turbine, but primarily we're really focused on the education. So we have all sorts of different ways that kids can be involved. We have um, we've developed a whole year a year's worth of sustainability and energy education. We've got sustainability, science of energy, uh, renewables, fossil fuels. We just cover the whole gamut, and it's a lot of hands-on activities. So we're trying to really get kids excited about science and math and engineering, and who couldn't be excited about those things? But <laughs> but we just want to make sure that the kids are their fair chance to be involved in science and um, just do a lot. We'll have some really great competitions. We'll have some design competitions. We'll, we'll be, we'll, we're going to um, so in February we're going to have one of these. It's going to be a, a kid wind design challenge. So we'll have this big wind tunnel built and kids from all over the state can be designing their little wind turbines and then we'll see which one can produce the most electricity. Uh, so it'll just be we'll have different categories for because some kids will color them and make them real beautiful. <laughs> they might not well, but they look nice and then some kids will get real serious I mean it's just I've been a part of a few of these competitions and it's just the best thing the kids get so excited and they learn something in the process teacher trainings going on this summer so as I said if any of you are educators and want to come in we'll have a four-day workshop to to talk about how to energy education to kids and give um, folks some hands-on some kits to go home with and so I think in the summer to wrap up 
In the fall, when school starts up again, we'll probably have um, 25 schools that are participating in the program in the education component. Uh, and then all the data from these sky streams all over the U.S. and some schools in Chile, they're all available online at Idaho National Lab. What the wind turbines are producing all over the, all over the continent at this point. So it'll be kind of just a really cool opportunity for kids to learn how to work in the real world. So. Um, Yeah. Well, Adam has a movie at 8 here. He's being kicked out. So, yeah, so we're going to wrap up. So, Pat and Kate will be here afterwards. And if you'd like to hear more about these lectures or other things going on at ASAP, we do have a sign in sheet for um, email.